Hey there. Um, there's an awful lot going on in this world right now. Um, sometimes I'll wake up in the middle of the night and lay awake for quite some time, uh, sometimes for hours. Um, just uh, ruminating over everything that is going on at this moment. Um, things seem to have uh, gone off the deep end, so to speak, um, beginning probably toward the end of uh, 2019, uh, when we first found out that there was a virus in uh, China. And previous to this uh, information, I believe there was an uprising going on in Hong Kong that uh, the Chinese government, uh, the communist government, uh, was trying to squash. Um, and I believe, from what I remember, and I do have pictures in my mind of uh, uh, dissidents in Hong Kong uh, holding up American flags. And uh, so I'm trying to piece together in my mind the events um, and we could go back further, but uh, it would be too time consuming. But uh, if we at least go back to this uprising in Hong Kong, and then we look at the next event, and the, what came next was news that there was a virus, uh, what we now know as COVID-19, which was... Uh, infecting people in uh, Wuhan um, and then as we know it uh, spread throughout the world and uh, impacted everyone uh, myself included I believe I've been sick with it twice um, I'm not I haven't uh, well let's not go there otherwise you know there will be censorship of the video but uh, so I myself was impacted. I was sick twice with it. The first time uh, was quite, uh, there was a lot of physical symptoms, um, not to the point where I had to be hospitalized, but uh, there were symptoms and uh, the uh, lower back ache, which was uh, very painful. Um, and from what I've heard, uh, some other people have experienced uh, uh, similar physical symptoms with aches and pains but but I did recover and I believe I have somewhat of some immunity against it but the latest news is that there is a new virus I mean a new mutant um, a new mutation of COVID-19 which was um, detected in South Africa, but they believe it actually first appeared in, I don't recall the name of the nation, but it was a, another country in uh, Africa, uh, Botswana perhaps, but I could be wrong. And so that's where it, the initial um, detection of the virus happened, and it happened in a man that was, or a patient, who was uh, suffering with AIDS, and somehow this uh, the virus mutated quite a bit in this individual's uh, body, and and now it's uh, it has spread in South Africa, um, and it has also been detected in I believe a European nation, and in Israel. Um, so now today there is uh, quite a bit of. Um, a lot of things uh, being said on the internet, uh, some news articles, and um, uh, Drudge himself had the headlines up in red, um, headlines about the virus. So it's you almost get the feeling of, uh, you know, here we go, you know, the next uh, stage in this situation we've all been living through. But a lot of what has been happening has gone beyond just you know, things to do with the virus. Uh, there, there's just been a lot of very unusual um, and crazy things uh, going on in politics and so many different uh, realms of our reality. Um, 
And there have been times when I have actually questioned <laughs> whether I'm still in, on the same planet and in the same world because of how drastic some of these um, events that have, have occurred have been. Things that you would think you would go to a theater, which I don't personally do, but you would go to a theater and watch a movie, and these things would be part of some um, fiction in some movie. Uh, but it's actually part of our everyday lives now. And so, um, how do we... Uh, think about these things and how do we address them in our own minds and if some of these subjects come up in conversation uh, yesterday was Thanksgiving and I would imagine that a lot of these topics uh, came up around the table as people sat down to eat turkey and the other things that people eat on Thanksgiving and um, so it is a curiosity to me as to how the different viewpoints that were shared, and I'm sure that uh, there was anger at times because these are trigger issues that have been going on, the political issues, um, the medical issues, the economic issues. There's an awful lot going on, not only in America, but around the world. So to take things even deeper, what I would like to address is not only uh, these events from a proximate perspective, but uh, let's look at them also from an ultimate perspective. As AOC um, some time ago was uh, commenting on some political or social issues and she made a point of distinguishing between the micro and the macro. So let's distinguish between the proximate and the ultimate. Now, in the proximate, we are looking at what we're experiencing on an everyday basis um, in our personal lives and what we see uh, going on around the world as well. Um, with, with neighbors, uh, with other nations, and so on. Um, so for me personally, the way I have come to find some sanity in understanding all these things that are going on is to um, somehow try to... Um, somehow try to, um, that's better, <laughs> um, somehow try to um, gain some perspective. And in order to gain some perspective, uh, it is definitely essential to separate um, things. And a, a lot of times I think people make the mistake in philosophy, theology, where things are kind of thrown into the same basket, uh, things that should be held separate. Because if you don't, then basically you don't gain a clear perspective of life and of all the things that are going on. You do have to separate things. Things may appear a certain way in the proximate context of life and reality. And so we look at things and they appear to be a certain way, but if we gain that higher perspective where we rise above and gain an ultimate perspective, then these things begin to take on a new light. We see them in a new light. And it is essential that this be done because some of these things that are going on in the proximate are insane, uh, just uh, evil, wicked, and so to make heads or tails of it all, I don't think that it's possible 
to do it in the proximate sense of things, you have to gain some ultimate perspective. Um, so, uh, in looking at, th at things from an angle, um, if we look at things in the proximate, we will see um, we will see contradictions um, in a lot of the things we see going on. Um, how do we rationalize um, the idea um, that there's a creator and that this creator is good, is kind, is loving, with um, what we see going on? Um, a lot of the stuff that's going on in this world, um, socially, for example, um, I do believe that it is essential for people to put their skills to work. Uh, people are skilled in different ways. The people are born with particular abilities or they develop specific abilities throughout their lives as they develop. And so they have gifts. They're gifted in certain areas. And when they put these gifts to use, uh, it benefits them in, in a variety of ways. And so when you have a capitalist system that basically turns people loose to um, practice and to uh, explore and to exercise these gifts, then you have a society where there's a lot of innovation, um, a lot of economic development. And, but also we need to have a clear perspective that there are people that are either not born with uh, gifts that would tend to advance them in life, or if they are born with such gifts, um, oftentimes they will experience a lot of impediments in their life um, which uh, block them or prevent them or harass them in a way whenever they try to exercise these gifts and to attain a better uh, quality of life. Um, and so this is where a lot of the socialism, I think, comes in and, and it's an attempt to somehow help those that even though they try to help themselves um, come up against a lot of uh, blockages in their lives uh, such blockages can come from other people uh, from um, uh, hereditary things um, for example there's a lot going on in america right now um, things to do with race and so on and there are claims that some people are held back because of their skin color um, uh, their origins ethnic origins and so on and that america or sometimes you know white people for example are holding back black people to be more specific or people of other ethnicities brown people and so on and um i would hope you know that such is not the case it's not the kind of nation i would like to live in i mean america is a nation of opportunity for everyone and a lot of black people have come forward and spoken and said that they've never um, found america to be a place where they couldn't uh, achieve their dreams they were able to exercise you know their particular gifts and to go forward and, and, and achieve things in America. But recently, what we've actually been hearing of, and, and there was a report, that white students were actually lying on their um, applications for college and so on, and instead of stating that they're white, they were claiming to be some mi type of a minority because they felt that it increased their chances of being accepted into, into their particular uh, college of uh, choice or university. And so what we have going on is um, a situation where people 
are not advancing based on their qualifications, their ability. Um, it's a type of racism now where people are being held down that are more qualified in favor of people who may be less qualified but who are of what is perceived to be an oppressed uh, class or uh, so in our society, which I don't think is true. I don't think it's actually happening. So what we're having going on is actually um, where things have gone, and then you have these um, groups of um, black people that are um, separating themselves and um, from white people. No, no one is forcing them to be separate. They are deliberately separating themselves into groups and saying these groups uh, are to be attended only by people of color. No whites are allowed. So it's segregation and they're bringing it on themselves and, and so it's a mess. Okay? Um, and uh, to get back to the, um, the financial aspects of things, I believe that we definitely need capitalism. You can't have socialism without some means of constantly feeding it and supporting it because you'll run out of money eventually. I mean, I'll, uh, you, you want to fund so many things, but if people aren't uh, in a system where they can actually be let loose to uh, pursue business and their particular careers and gifts um, without a lot of obstacles in the way, then a lot of these programs that people want to do, uh, these social programs, are going to run out of money because there won't be people who will be paying the taxes to keep this going. Um, so I believe in a system where there is capitalism, but I do believe that the, that people in our society who are, who experience a lot of, um, blockages in their attempts to make something of themselves, that they should have some help. And there is a lot of things that are being tossed around out there. Um, one thing I've heard about is universal uh, basic income, which um, I don't know where I stand on it, but it's there are different ideas that are being tossed around to help people. Um, and it could be um, a valuable thing to do as long as the uh, possibilities are there to always advance and that blockages aren't going to be put in the way of people, uh, such as making it so difficult for uh, businesses and individuals to actually have the ability to grow their business, to grow their particular careers by investing the money that they're earning back into what they're doing because um, if businesses, uh, businesses and so on have less capital uh, to put back into um, what it is that they're doing, then the growth will be stifled. So there needs to be some balance. Um, and so these are things where we're trying in the proximate context of things of trying to find some way to resolve all these problems. And so how does this relate to the virus? Well, um, there's an awful lot going on that goes beyond. It doesn't get into the ultimate context of things. We haven't gone there yet. It's still in the proximate, but it's more beyond the proximate in the sense that it goes beyond our particular everyday surroundings, our family, friends, neighbors. And there are people uh, and, and influences that are happening beyond this that are affecting us. Um, such things as um, very wealthy, uh, very powerful people that are manipulating things from behind the scenes. And there is definitely a sense of a malevolent agenda behind all the things that are going on. It's not accidental. And this is part of what we're going to get into, whether 
uh, there is such a thing as truly an accident or, or, or a chance happening or whether things are manipulated and controlled so that there is uh, a particular outcome even though from the everyday man's perspective all he will see or she is chaos and but for someone actually maneuvering all these things it's not chaos because it's part of a plan that leads to an eventual outcome or goal and so um with all this that's going on, there is an eventual goal, it seems, that some individuals have in mind, and it all comes down to control. Controlling people, uh, controlling their travels, um, controlling what they can or can't do, controlling aspects of people's health. Um, I mean... Uh, People have, or should have, um, the ability to make personal choices that they themselves decide upon as to whether they want to or do not want to, to do or not do a particular thing. And so a lot of the stuff that's going on now infringes upon these freedoms that people should have. And that's a whole um, wider discussion that we can have as far as whether people have freedom but in the proximate context we would like to think that we have freedoms and that we want to have the freedom to make decisions that impact our health our family uh, where we want to live uh, the things we want to buy the things we want to sell uh, where we want to travel to and it seems that with the virus, they have found the perfect thing to get their foot in the door and then wedge it open into our lives to control all these aspects of our lives that we should have control over. And these are decisions we should make and that there shouldn't be government authorities telling us what you can or can't do as far as uh, these sorts of things go. Um, and so, um, and of course, um, there are the deeply disturbing things that we see happen in life, um, the rapes, the murders, uh, the tortures, um, just an awful lot of things that when you deeply think about them, um, they disturb you to a, just to no end. For me personally anyways and so I've had a lot of time to think about these things and little by little by stages I've been gaining some understanding now I don't think that anyone ever gets to the point where they are all-knowing and that's a big key in understanding life and in having empathy for people because even the people that do the most vile and evil things in this world, you need to have some understanding of why they are the way they are, why they do the things that they do, and when you gain this understanding, then you can become a better human being. And then the focus changes from punishment to rehabilitation, or perhaps from punishment and sometimes punishment is needed in order to affect the change but the goal shouldn't be to punish for the sake of punishing to inflict as much pain and retribution as possible uh, revenge is not the goal the goal should not be revenge the goal should be how do we fix it so it doesn't happen again and in a lot of cases with these heavily atrocious, uh, atro these heavy atrocities that are committed, um, I mean, there are cases where the death penalty seems to be the only solution. But there are other cases where um, certain uh, acts of uh, certain things that people do um, can be looked at and then examining or looking at people's lives and um, 
looking at people's lives and trying to understand where they're coming from, how they arrived at what they at where they are, and how things played out the way they did. And so, um, we can't just look at people and think, well, you know, they just got up one morning and they went and did what they did. We have to look and see what led to this, uh, what conditions. Um, from the moment of birth, as well as beyond birth, going back into their families, uh, what things happened in, um, in, in family lines that eventually led to uh, certain genetic leanings or, or other aspects. I mean, there are spiritual aspects that happen in people's uh, uh, lines and their family lines that can affect children, um, uh, demonic, um, oppressions and so on things that follow families from generation to generation and so these things need to be addressed and uh, but and there are also genetic aspects um, of course and, and so this gets into the question of do we or have we ever made the choice to exist that I mean uh, the, our parents made the choice to get together and from that we're born but beyond that be, beyond the human choices that are involved and and you had no say in whether your parents got together and produced you but even beyond our parents making that decision there are, are other factors that come into play that they did not decide upon that brought this event uh, to happen from which you were born um, you didn't uh, decide upon your sex, your height, uh, your skin color, your hair, and so, so many aspects of who and what you are. Not just externally, but internally. Often people will compare a child to a parent and, and say, oh, they are so similar in their behaviors and so on. Because there's a lot more that is passed on from parents to kids than just the physical aspects. Uh, there's uh, aspects of personality and, and so on. And other things, uh, like I said, along spiritual lines. Uh, things that parents and grandparents and great-grandparents have dealt with that pass on from generation to generation. And so life there shouldn't be so much of a quick ru rush to judge people and this can produce more of a compassionate world where we do recognize that there are evil things that need to be dealt with but um, it may not be the best course of action to deal with things from a point of revenge but rather from a point of correcting things of looking at people and, and realizing that in a lot of cases, people just had no other choice. Um, if you look deep enough into people's lives and into everyone, even our own lives, if you look deep enough and think deep enough about it, you should be able to come to the conclusion that we all do things or don't do things that in the grand scheme of things there really was no I mean we do make choices but there wasn't a freedom of choice involved because we were put on a course that we were going to be and do what we were going to be and do and there was just no other uh, outcome to it and we do make the choices, of course. We make all the choices in our lives. But these choices don't just magically ar arise you know, from some void, some vacuum somewhere. These choices are fed by factors um, that come from within ourselves and from outside ourselves. Factors that we don't decide upon or ultimately initiate. We are created creatures. We didn't create ourselves. And so from the inception of creation, all that has been, is, and will, will be was baked in at that original moment of creation. Um, 
in the ultimate sense, when we think of creation and the creator, we see a being who is the prime mover of things, but because he's separate from creation and not subject to cause and effect, because he's an eternal being that has no beginning, he's actually an, the uncaused, unmoved mover. And so within this uh, proximate context of life that we live in, we do make choices. We make choices all the time. But from the ultimate context of things, these are things that were meant to be. And, and we're just simply uh, working out or living out a script that was written into creation at the beginning. And if we look at scripture, one thing I've found very helpful is we need to look at the original text. And if we read our Bibles in English, oftentimes when we're reading, if we don't have this knowledge that I'm about to share, if we're reading, and so we'll read, well, God did this, God said this, or the Lord did this, or the Lord said this. And if we look at the original text, in the Hebrew, we'll notice that in the original, it'll say Elohim, or it'll say El, or it'll say Eloah, or it'll say Jehovah. Now, Jehovah is what we read in our Bibles as Lord. And then God, in the original, can be El. El is found in um, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, it, it, it speaks of El. And El is described as a being that is all-knowing, who brings about everything he wishes. Nothing comes about that is not his will. And that's El. If we look at the book of Job, we'll notice that in the initial two chapters, it begins with Jehovah. And this is the being that is physical, that can be seen and touched. And, and we see the same being in the book of Genesis, when he eats in the presence of uh, Abraham, in, I believe, chapter 18, if I remember correctly. Then we also see, perhaps, I may have the chapters wrong, but not sure of the chapter. It could be 32, Genesis 32, or 29, maybe, I'm not sure. But we see where Jacob wrestles with the Lord. And this is a physical being. And this being cannot get the upper hand on Jacob. Um, we see this being Jehovah walking in the Garden of Eden. He was walking. Uh, this is the being that uh, Moses uh, looked upon and saw his back parts. This is the being that Moses and the elders that were with him up on the mountain uh, saw his feet. Now this is Jehovah, the same being we see in Genesis chapter 6, verse 7, I mean verse 5 through 7, we see Jehovah, a being that looks at all the evil going on in the world and he regrets what he looks at and his heart is troubled. Now Jehovah, if you compare Jehovah to El in um, Isaiah 46, 9, and 10, El is a being that knows the end from the beginning. He does whatever he wishes. Now, such a being would not regret what he did, or, or his heart would not be troubled over um, some action that he took, because he does whatever he pleases. His purposes are always accomplished. So, it, so this goes back to making these essential uh, distinctions, so that we may understand. We have to make, we need to make a distinction between the proximate and the ultimate, and a distinction between El, Elohim, Eloah, and Jehovah. And when we look at particular texts, such as Jeremiah 18, I believe, where it talks about Jehovah. He says, things that did not come into my mind. Now, this is Jehovah. And, um, and so this is where, if we're 
going to have a discussion of these matters of free will and predestination and determinism. And if we approach the subject or these subjects with a uh, more of a generic term of saying, well, God this and God that and God this and God that, it is going to throw everything into confusion. Distinctions need to be made between the source, which is the Father, which is overall, who is in the ultimate, who controls and determines everything. And in the more proximate context, we have Jehovah, which, in act, in, in, which is Jesus. Jesus is Jehovah. And Jesus has limitations, as we can see, and Jehovah has limitations. We see him in Genesis 6, 5 through 7. He, he has a limitation because he looks at a world which he was involved in the creation of, but was not aware of all the aspects of everything involved with it, the outcomes and how things would play out, because he's the word. The word that came forth from the creator, God, Elohim, El, Eloah, the word came forth, which is Jesus, Jehovah, and this word created, but words are specific and they are held within certain parameters. So the word that is spoken does not know everything that's in the mind of the source or the Father. And so we look at Jesus where he says, uh, well, if we look at um, Jehovah in the 18th chapter of Genesis, he has to wait for the two angels that go to Sodom and Gomorrah in order to then know whether they have done the evil that's been reported to him. Um, the same thing when um, Abraham is tested. And then he's tested and the Lord wants him to offer up um, his son Isaac as a sacrifice. And when it's over... The Lord says to him, now I know. So he says, now I know. It, this had to play out, so then he would know. If we look at Jesus, we see that he, does, he didn't know, and possibly still doesn't know, the day or hour of his return. If we look at the first chapter of Revelation, the first verse, we read, and this is after Jesus was resurrected, we see that he does not know the revelation that he is about to give to uh, John prior to giving it. He only has the knowledge after. So he says, the text says, the revelation which Jesus received from God to give to John. And... Uh, so it is essential to make these distinctions. And, and, and one of the things that um, can be a challenge in understanding things from an ultimate and proximate perspective is the question of whether God is evil. Because um, if it's based or if the outcome of his determinations uh, behind creation result in people that do evil things is God evil for doing this and so then we get into the question of how do you um, pass judgment on God as far as what he does whether it's good or evil what do you base this on now we are under laws that we live by and when these laws are broken then a determination is made that something evil has been done based on these laws. God is a being that is what we call ex-lex. ex, -lex. ex -lex means he is not under any law. There are no laws that tell God what he should do or shouldn't do. God does as he wills, and that's because he's God. He's above everything and can do as he wishes. Whatever God determines and decides to do is good. So, if we have that understanding, then we can see that in the proximate context of things, 
we do have challenges as far as good and evil and things that uh, that break laws and so on. A, a, a very good example is when we look at the crucifixion of Christ. And so we have uh, a law in the, in the Torah that says, you shall not murder. So this is a law that God, um, that we live under, that we're subject to. And then, so if you look at the crucifixion of Christ, you will, you can read in the book of Acts, I can't recall the location, but there is a place where it says, and you murdered um, Jesus. You killed Jesus. You murdered Jesus. So it, the, what happened to Jesus was a murder. He was murdered. But um, the text in um, Acts 4.28 says, that all these people, the Pilate and Judas, all these people who were involved in the killing of Jesus did so because God had determined it to happen. He determined it, and there was no way of, of getting around. All these people, Pilate, Judas, from the moment, from even from before being born, they were determined to do what they did in order for a certain outcome to happen, which God had decided would happen according to his will. It's what he wanted, it's what he planned, and he worked everything out, all the people involved, all the players, so Jesus would be murdered. And so it says in Romans uh, 4, chapter 4, verse 28, everything they did was determined beforehand by God. Um, we have other, uh, there's a variety of other uh, texts uh, throughout scripture, uh, such as the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. Now the same way that um, a canal or a river or a flowing body of water can be controlled by its banks um, it's the same way that God is able to control human hearts. God can so uh, maneuver the banks of the human heart so that the heart flows in the direction and makes the decisions that God wants. The king's heart is in the hands of the Lord as the rivers of water. He directs it wherever he wishes. Now that's in Proverbs 19... Um, well, 1921 is a different verse. It says, there are many plans in the human heart, but it's the purpose of the Lord that, uh, uh, that, 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 that materializes. Um, so we can have all, make all these rationalizations, these plans, but the eventual outcome is what God determines, what he wants. And so there's another one that says, another a proverb that says, we toss the dice, but the outcome is determined by God. So these dice, we toss them up in the air and they tumble and tumble, but they land exactly as God wants. And so we have all these thoughts and plans and things going through our mind, but they land and we arrive at the decision that God wants us to have. Um, now the other verse, I believe, I could be wrong, I believe it's 21, uh, Proverbs 21 verse 1. I could be wrong, but so it says the heart of the Lo uh, the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord as the rivers of water and he directs it wherever he wishes. So when we look at things from this uh, aspect of seeing the ultimate and the proximate, it does help in a lot of ways. Uh, and it is a mess uh, what is going on in the world. It's disturbing, it's troubling and but somehow, from an ultimate perspective, it's just meant to be. And um, um, so, so those are my uh, thoughts on all this insanity that's going on all around us. Um, just all the greed, and greed is a huge problem. Um, greed is causing a lot of problems in this world. Um, People, of course, are um, there. If people work and earn, they're entitled to what they work and earn. But 
things have gotten to the point where we have people that are just extremely wealthy and um, it's not it's troublesome because you look at these ranges where you have these extremely wealthy people and and then this extreme poverty and as stated people are entitled to what they work for what they earn but we need a world where people will make decisions that will be more beneficial for everyone uh, and so people that have these great uh, this exuberant amount of wealth they need to make decisions um, where they use their wealth to actually benefit others and help others uh, what is the point of buying these huge mansions or these enormous yachts um, all these things that people are doing um, that in the end when they leave here they can't take it with them and so in looking back wouldn't they rather look back and say i helped a lot of people i mean there were there were people that were hurting and i helped them instead of looking back and saying i spent so much on myself and i was selfish and everything was about me and a lot of these super wealthy people are doing things um where they're giving money to causes and so on but these causes uh, are not actually things that in uh, the general or, or in the better sense will actually help people um, they're funding a lot of causes and movements that uh, things that actually are harmful to humanity that uh, break down people's morals and um, just things that that are not good and rather they should take if they so decide to do they should take um, this philanthropy that they do they should direct it more toward helping the poor and raising people up and providing a better standard of living for people that uh, just were not as fortunate uh, as they were and and people do try in life people make attempts to get ahead in life and sometimes life doesn't cooperate and ultimately of course um, whether you're rich or poor it's in the father's hands and in the, in the source's hands he makes such decisions for his own purposes um, um, and so as i said those are my thoughts thank you for taking the time to listen.